My name is Bill MacDonald, and I brought my father's World War II soldier's paybook. When my father passed away in 1978, my brother was executor, and he offered the paybook to me because he knew I had an interest in history, but didn't have a great relationship with my father, kind of ambivalent about it, threw it in a drawer, left it there until years later I ran across it and kind of had another look at it. Reconnaissance units scout ahead of a larger military force to determine the location and capabilities of enemy troops, as well as information about terrain and infrastructure. Today, satellites and drones help gather intelligence, but during the Second World War, the only way to get it involved putting soldiers in harm's way. While air surveillance helped, it couldn't provide the same level of detail as having boots on the ground. Canadian reconnaissance units were typically outfitted with radio communications, motorcycles and lightly armoured vehicles that sacrificed defensive capabilities for speed. When the opportunity arose, recon units would attack weak enemy positions, but strong points would be identified and left for the larger assault group. We're here with Bill McDonald. And Bill, you've brought in a, a family heirloom. This is my, my father, Bill McDonald's World War II soldier's paybook. And it kind of spurred me on to get his war records because the regimental numbers it yep. indicated in there. And it's kind of been a journey of, of, of insight into him and also his, his regiment, the 8th Reconnaissance Regiment. Oh yeah, exactly. The paybook is something that was issued to all members of the Canadian Forces that have all this pertinent information, his attestation number or his, his service number. With increases of rank and pay, they'd carry these with them all the time. But this is one of sometimes one of the most common things people save from their time in the service. Because a lot of times these in the First and Second War could be used to validate military pensions okay. or, or prove the fact that they were in the service. They're well-worn. They're well-worn his whole war is here. And again, we were talking about your dad and that he enlisted in 1940. Saskatchewan Light Infantry. The Saskatchewan Light Infantry. Machine Gun Division, apparently. He transferred over to the 8th Recce Regiment. That's right, in England. The 8th Reconnaissance Regiment were the eyes and ears of the Canadian 2nd Division. The reconnaissance units are always way out in front. They go in and they literally, like, see who's holding the roads, who's set up in a town. They supply that information that goes to the intelligence section, which goes back to the sort of overall arc and command of the division and the army as such. The 8th Reconnaissance Regiment are the first Allied troops to occupy Dieppe in the campaign when the Germans have left. To give people an idea, the distance between a reconnaissance outfit and the main body that they're part of, they hold Dieppe alone for right. 14 hours before the rest of the army right. meets up with them, right? Reconnaissance regiments, the armored cars, light armored vehicles like that will take a lot of hits and punishment from German heavy artillery 88s, 75 millimeter guns and Panther tanks 88s from Tigers. So it's a very precarious way to conduct the war. Yeah. You're way out in front and everybody else is away before they're gonna catch up with you. I didn't know anything about them until I started reading about them and I was amazed. That term that they described them as, as the uh, irrepressible eighth wrecking. Irrepressible. And yeah. so their battle honors, I was amazed at. Yeah. They actually spearheaded the liberation of Falais yeah. and other, other, other cities and towns. Battle honors were really quite incredible. Well, they are the summer of 1944 to the spring of 1945. They're a very, very active regiment, the reconnaissance unit, to the point that you can look at their battle honors for the Second World War, they have 15, 15 battle honors. And those are acquired again from uh, July of 1944 to the crossing of the Rhine in 1945 and the surrender of Nazi Germany. His father would have been in almost constant combat. He would have experienced a long, hard role. Public Archives Canada sent me basically all the records that they had, his service records. So almost 10 years from the time that I first got the payroll book to the time that I then went to Ottawa and thought I kind of wanted to, to know more, resolve some of my outstanding grievances and issues with my father. This paybook ended up kind of being a bit of a touchstone, a doorway into kind of learning a lot more about him and really increasing my appreciation for the experiences that he and my Uncle Harry and others had in World War II, and that a lot of what happened to them, their experiences, they came back and, and didn't process very well. No. The drinking, the fighting, the, the, the womanizing, 
My father abandoned the family when I was three, I think, uh, and then kind of came in and out of our lives over the course of many years. The one that kind of struck me, I suppose, is his exit interview. And so here was this Captain Irwin, who then has got my father in front of him, the war's at an end. And his description of him, which I read with great interest, says, this physically fit, keen-eyed, 24-year-old man has an attractive appearance, is gentlemanly and appreciative, and has a manner that pleases the public. So certainly not the guy that I that I grew up with and, and knew. Those kinds of issues with my father, I think might have gotten even more aggravated in, in wartime and, and kind of just brought them back with them and, and sure. stuff. So uh, I prefer to remember that exit interview, description of my father, I think that's a really nice one. For, again, those earlier generations of Canadians, people really had no great understanding of what a lot of people went through. Veterans did, they all knew what they'd gone through. But again, they come from that generation, especially the Second War folks, of the old expression of you carry your own water means you carry your load with you. Did you ever speak to your dad or hear your father talk about his time overseas? Uh, only one particular time. The only person that he knows that he killed was the subject of the discussion. And because they were a reconnaissance regiment, because they went ahead of everybody, he came into a clearing buildings, I guess, and, and he came around a corner in, in one building and, and there was a German soldier. They came face to face with each other and the German soldier moved uh, sort of towards my father, uh, at which point he drew his weapon and shot and killed the German, realizing, of course, that really what he was doing was perhaps surrendering his rifle. So that's probably why that stayed with him and, and that's probably why he shared it. Yeah. 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 Well, again, Bill, I'd like to thank you again on behalf of the program and the Army Museum well, thank you. for bringing this in and sharing with us. This was a healing journey for me. Great. Uh, and it was all kicked off by just this you know, little soldier's payroll. Little soldier's book. Book. Yeah. yeah. I would encourage everybody who has a family member who served in whatever the conflict might be to get their service records and gain that kind of insight into them. It's a big thing of what we do at the Army Museum is we kind of bear witness for these past generations of Canadians that have gone overseas and fought, died, or maimed, or came home and maybe not have lost a leg, but their souls are marked by the experience of war. It'll give you a greater appreciation and a knowledge of what your family went through and the people you knew but did not know completely because of the things they never shared.